Oh, how do you do? We've, uh, well, you've just caught us both drinking, but you know about actors and performers. Um, uh, seriously, folks, if you just joined us, by that I mean didn't see my program last time, uh, I was talking with uh, certainly one of the most respected, best-liked, elegant, successful, uh, and, and highly thought of actors in our business, um, a man who is not only a apparently perfect screen actor, but also a, an author of some renown, and his books, The Moon's a Balloon and Bring on the Empty Horses, were best-selling autobiographies, and uh, he has changed paces and done uh, a novel called Go Slowly, Come Back Quickly. And the man I'm talking about, of course, is the natty, incredible, incomparable, <laughs> and I'm sure uncomfortable at this moment for being <laughs> overpraised, David Niven. Are you welcome. Him, too. Uh, Mr. Niven, may I call you David after all, yeah, yeah, all, all no, of this chat? Yeah. Uh, by the way, Mr. Niven is fresh off the, uh, you're at the moment on the air, having just been in it. And um, maybe we should talk about the problem of jet lag, which everybody in our business seems to have. Is there any cure for it that you know of? Um, oh, I wish there was. I, it gets me in the throat. I, I, maybe the, the um, air conditioning or something, but uh, mm -hmm. I always get raspy, raspy. The ball, but there's it. We live with it. You don't sound raspy, but I'm sure you <clears throat> feel raspy. Uh, last night, if it was in fact last night, I mentioned something about Joan Crawford, and I didn't know, and wouldn't have without you, that she had pretensions to another kind of performing other than just screen acting. Uh, do you know what I'm referring to? Yeah, I do. What? What? what I forgot you. You. You got a okay. memory like a. Good God. <laughs> like, a, like a plugged up sieve. <laughs> she did. She wanted to sing opera. That's right. And and oh, I never forget it. She, <clears throat> she she made a recording with the full uh, Metro Goldwyn Mayer Orchestra of Aida. And she asked Fred Astaire and his wife and me to go and listen. It was the most uh, horrific night of my life. <laughs> And it's awful. We get, we get past the point of, of giggling. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it gets very painful because, uh, oh, it went on, and I mean, two sides. <laughs> Was it that sort of thing where you've held in laughter to the point where you think you're going to explode, and, oh. and little muffled explosions that you pretend are coughing? And Fred, <laughs> went, Fred went the most extraordinary color. He really went blue. <laughs> Fred Astaire went <Yeah>. blue. <laughs> oh. Uh, did you then afterwards have to say? Oh, well, uh, how wonderful it was, of course, it went does. Mm. People said to me. Well, apparently she was, a, we've learned from that book anyway, of operatic proportions in some ways. Um, I don't know, do you? She really longed to it, longed to sing, and she made a brave stab at it too, but she couldn't get the notes out. <laughs> that can be a drawback, <laughs> can it? <laughs> it, it I'd like to hear actors comment on the directors they've worked with. Um, would it be fair to say that you have a favorite, particularly, or were just very fond of, of William Wyler as a director? Well, he was a great director, but he was hell to work with, oh. I thought. A, a wonderful director, but he was, a, he was very inarticulate in a funny way. Mm -hmm. And I was with, uh, with him and with... Larry Olivia, this is uh, Wuthering Heights, called 1903 or something. <laughs> but standing next to Larry, when, and Wyler would say, do it again. And you'd do it again, long scene, do it again. He'd go on and on and on. He'd never tell you why. And he really couldn't. He knew exactly what he wanted, but he just hoped you'd get it. Mm. And I was there when he said to Olivia, do it again. And, we, and Olivia said, <clears throat> Look, Willie, we, I've done this scene 42 times. <laughs> I've done it differently 42 times. Just tell me, what do you want me to do? And Wilder said, just be better. <laughs> uh, <to> Olivia. <laughs> <laughs> and was he left standing by Olivia? Left standing, or did no, he, he did. He went on and on doing it. But he was, he was uh, with me, I did two pictures with him, three. And the first one, I played a very uh, small part in Dodsworth with Ruth Chatterton. 
And he sat under the camera with the Hollywood reporter. He said, I'd turn him over and then would read the paper while I was doing it. While they were filming? Yes. And then cut, do it again. <laughs> I know. Went on and on. We read the whole paper, do it again. I was acting my guts out over there. <clears throat> That's infuriating, isn't it? When the second one came, which was Wuthering Heights, I was under contract to Sam Goldwyn for 15 years. He put me into that. And there's one part, Edgar, in Wuthering Heights, which actors grow beards and go to the Seychelles Islands forever rather than play that part. It's the worst part ever written. And I had to play it. So I said no. So Goldwyn said, you're, you're on suspension. You don't get paid. I said, that's fine. I had no money. So I was suspended. And Wyler came to see me in my little hovel I lived in. The great director said, David, I want you to play in my movie. Will you please help me? I never heard such a thing. Oh, yes, sir, and all that. <laughs> Will you play again? I said, oh, I can't wait, you fool. <laughs> I said, one thing, Mr. Wyler, last time he was so beasty, so rude, so awful to me that I said no to this. Now, will you have dinner with me the night before I start work this time so I can remind you that you're going to be nice and kind? <laughs> and he said, he said, I give you my word of honor, David. I'm a changed man. I've been nice and kind. So we had dinner the night before I started shooting. Great fun. He's a charming man off the, the stage. Mm -hmm. And I said, tomorrow? He said, tomorrow, David, no problem. I've been nice and kind, I promise you. We we'll have a lovely time. So I was dressed up as Edgar, Merlot runs in the coach, and we had, I had to drive his two foul horses round the heather. We stopped, and Merle said, come in, Edgar, and have some tea. And I had to say, as soon as I put the horses away, cut. He was up there somewhere. Yes? He said, don't try to be funny. <laughs> <laughs> Do it again, right? Drip, 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 drip. Stop. Come and have some tea as soon as I put the horses away. Cut. Not a comedy, you know. It went on. <laughs> Fifty times I drove the bloody animals around. The <laughs> Finally, I said, look, I was going go mad. I said, Willie, you are a son of a bitch, aren't you? He said, he said yes, and I'm going to be for 15 months. And that was... Oh, weeks, I mean. That was oh, <laughs> weeks. That was before the days of Cleopatra. He, he was nice. He'd got nice, huh? Well, what in the hell was he doing? I mean, what... I think he just, as, as I said, he couldn't really explain, although he had it all in his head, brilliantly. Is and it possible that he record just... record of great, great yeah. movies. Now, on the other hand, you'll get a, a director like, um, apparently John Ford often printed the first take. I worked with him, too. I loved him, of course. I think everyone did. Yeah. <clears throat> he, he loved... Uh, he had favorites. He had people he liked and, uh, more than others. Thank God he liked me. And uh, I had a birthday. I joined the picture, so Jack Ford said, all right, David, tonight, you've got very little to do tomorrow, just binding up George Sanders' arm, so and really tie one on. But I don't drink very much anyway, so I went out. I thought, that, you know, I must please him. <laughs> and I drank. I drank all night. <laughs> If you really set out to get drunk, it's very difficult, isn't it? So I worked at it, <laughs> and I came lurching back in the morning onto the set, thinking how happy John Ford would be. <laughs> and he said, what's, what's the matter with you? I said, oh, good morning, Jack. He said, don't call me Jack. Mr. Ford, do you? I said, oh, good morning, Mr. Ford. He said, he said are you drunk? I said, yes. <laughs> <laughs> thinking how happy he'd be. He said, all right, send for Mr. Zanuck. Zanuck, Zanuck, the head of the studio. Incidentally, the only man in the world who could eat an apple through a tennis racket. He had those funny... <laughs> <laughs> but he came, uh, on came Zanuck. Now, people are backing away from me. Every, I'm all alone. <laughs> Zanuck came on, he's surrounded by his henchmen. All right, Jack, what's the problem? So. Paul said, well, this actor, this English actor, is drunk, Mr. Zanuck, on your picture. So Zanuck said, I'm at the end of my career. <laughs> he said, uh, all right, let, let's hear a take. So Ford said, all right, put a white coat on, give me the stethoscope, 
And there in the box of um, dressing is, I'd never heard about these. <laughs> stethoscope. They put me in a white coat and a stethoscope <laughs> and a box. And, and I said, where's the stethoscope? He hit the pocket, right? Turn him over. And I bound up George's arm. And then he said, pick up the stethoscope. And out came a snake. <laughs> and a snake. <laughs> and then he said, put the dressing on. Said, dressing. <laughs> Full of little green turtles. Oh, but turtles. Oh, okay, yes. <laughs> they print, and they used to run it in their houses for years. <laughs> <laughs> You've gone to all that trouble, too. <laughs> Wonderful story. <coughs> um, you know, it's famous Orson Welles' remark, who's the best director in Hollywood, and who are the best three directors, I almost blew it. And Welles would say, John Ford, John Ford, and John Ford. Um, what is it that's so admired about his pictures that Wells and others say things like that about him and he's so adored by the cineasts and others? I like his pictures, you know, like the Stagecoach and Hurricane is one of my favorite, but it would be hard for me to say what is it that John Ford does that other people don't. I, I think, of it, I, I don't know, I, I can't answer it, but he, he, he was the total opposite to Willie Wilder we were talking about because he knew exactly what he wanted but could explain it. And he would print one take. He'd maybe do it a couple of times, hardly ever, two or three times, print it, and that was it. Didn't matter if the sound man said, I don't matter about you, print it. Mm -hmm. And there was nothing that the editor could do except join it together. He never went to see his dailies, the rushes, you know, the work from the day before. Yeah. He knew that he'd shot what he wanted, and it was going to be stuck together, and that was the film. He was, he was, he was totally great, I thought. That, that was quite... I haven't answered your question. I'm very, it, it's well, I, maybe there is no... I, I think he did immense preparation. He pretended he didn't, of course. Yeah. But, 